have a story to tell you today, but first I have to lay the groundwork for the story. Among the texts of this Mass today, we have from St. Paul pointing out that we are one body in one spirit. Now, if we are in one, of, in one body and one spirit, then we can recall words elsewhere of St. Paul's that, tell, that teach us that we, um, how does he put it? Now oh, my mind just went blank. It's because I'm in my 50s now. I'm well into my 50s. I'm 56. And so this happens increasingly. All right, so what he says is that we share in one another's sufferings and we share in one another's glory. So that is why we have a veneration of the saints we have a veneration in the saints because we share in their glory and also we embrace our sufferings as Christians and we shouldn't complain or grumble about our sufferings because we share one another's sufferings. So, I mean, you can complain about, you know, you can complain about your spouse, you can complain about your sibling, you can complain about your neighbor because they make you suffer and you share in their sufferings but also they share in your sufferings. Certainly we make others suffer. Sometimes, sometimes our very presence walking into a room, somebody might suffer because they can't stand us or whatever. But also we can think about your sickness or you can think about maybe you have a relative or a friend or a loved one or a spouse who has cancer or who has some something that causes them to suffer physically. All right then, if we are in one body, then we share in one another's sufferings. Now, if you reject all suffering, if you reject all suffering in your life and you refuse to suffer and you seek diversions so that you won't suffer and you turn to this or that so that you won't suffer, well, you'll still suffer. You can't run away from it. It's still there. You just make yourself more miserable by trying to avoid it. But you have to think, well, what about this loved one who has cancer? Or what about this loved one who is suffering from this or that ailment? Maybe an emotional ailment. Maybe a physical ailment. Maybe a mental ailment. Well, if you're refusing all suffering that comes your way, then you're, not, then you're not willing to share in their suffering when you could be taking some of their suffering away. That loved one who's suffering, you could be easing them of some of their suffering by embracing the suffering that comes your way and not trying to banish all semblance of suffering. So what it means then to love thy neighbor as thyself is to acknowledge that whatever your joys or sufferings, they are connected with other people's joys and sufferings. But also you can think about your sins, even those private sins, those sins that you think nobody knows about because they're committed behind closed doors. Nobody knows about them. But others share in the sufferings because of your sins. Your private sins are a source of suffering for others because others are weighed down by your sin, even if it is in secret, even if nobody else knows about it but you. But of course, God knows about your suffering, or God knows about your secret sins, and your guardian angel knows about your secret sins. Your guardian angel is forced to watch you. And the demon that's assigned to you also is forced to watch you. And what I've heard is that demons find sin abhorrent, but they want you to commit it. There are certain sins that they find abhorrent, especially sins against nature but they want you to commit them because they want you to be damned as well. So no sin is, is in secret. You're being watched by more than one. 
Now, with that in mind, I want you to listen to this story. It's a famous story, but maybe you have not heard it. This is the story of, of His Excellency, a bishop by the name of William Emanuel Kettler, who lived from 1811 to 1877. And here's the story. In 1869, a German diocesan bishop was sitting together with his guest, Bishop Kettler from Mainz. And during the course of their conversation, the diocesan bishop brought up his guest's extremely blessed apostolate. Bishop Kettler explained to his host, I owe thanks for everything that I have accomplished with God's help to the prayer and sacrifice of someone I do not even know. I can only say that I know somebody has offered his or her whole life to our loving God for me, and I have this sacrifice to thank that I even became a priest. He continued, Originally I wasn't planning on becoming a priest. I had already finished my law degree and thought only about finding an important place in the world to begin acquiring honor, prestige, and wealth. An extraordinary experience held me back and directed my life down a different path. One evening, I was alone in my room considering my future plans of fame and fortune when something happened which I cannot explain. Was I awake or asleep? Did I really see it? Or was it just a dream? One thing I do know, it brought about a change in my life. I saw Jesus very clearly and distinctly standing over me in a radiant cloud, showing me his sacred heart. A nun was kneeling before him, her hands raised up in prayer. From his mouth I heard the words, She prays unremittingly for you. I distinctly saw the appearance of the sister, and her traits made such an impression on me that she has remained in my memory to this day. She seemed to be quite an ordinary lay sister. Her clothes were very poor and rough. Her hands were red and calloused from hard work. Whatever it was, a dream or not, it was extraordinary. It shook me to the depths of my being so that from that moment on I decided to consecrate myself to God in the service of the priesthood. I withdrew to a monastery for a retreat and I talked about everything with my confessor and then at the age of 30 I began studying theology and you know the rest of the story. So if you think that I have done something admirable, now you know who really deserves the credit, a religious sister who prayed for me maybe without even knowing who I was. I'm convinced I was prayed for and I will continue to be prayed for in secret and that without these prayers I could never have reached the goal that God has destined for me. Do you have any idea of the whereabouts or the identity of who has prayed for you? asked the diocesan bishop. No, I can only ask God each day that while she is still on earth, he bless and repay her a thousandfold for what she has done for me. The next day, Bishop Kettler visited a convent of sisters in a nearby city and celebrated Holy Mass in their chapel. He was distributing Holy Communion to the last row of sisters when one of them suddenly caught his eye, and his face grew pale, and he stood there motionless. And finally, regaining his composure, he gave Holy Communion to the sister who was kneeling in recollection, unaware of his hesitation. And he then concluded the liturgy. The bishop who had invited him the previous day came and joined him at the convent for breakfast. And when they had finished, Bishop Kettler asked the Mother Superior to present to him all the sisters in the house. Before long, she had gathered all the sisters together, and both bishops went to meet them. Bishop Kettler greeted them, but it was apparent that he did not find the one he was looking for, and he quietly asked the Mother Superior, Are all the sisters really here? She looked over the group of sisters and then said, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, I called them all, but in fact one of them is not here. Why didn't she come? She works in the barn, answered the Superior, and in such a commendable way that in her enthusiasm 
she sometimes forgets other things. I would like to see that sister, requested the bishop. A little while later, the sister who had been summoned stepped into the room. Again, Bishop Kettler turned pale, and after a few words to all the sisters, he asked if he could be alone with the sister who had just come in. Do you know me? he asked her. I have never seen your excellency before. Have you ever prayed for me or offered up a good deed for me? He wanted to know. I do not recall that I have ever heard of your excellency. The bishop was silent for a few moments and then he asked, do you have a particular devotion that you like? The devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus was the response. You have, it seems, the most difficult task in the convent, he continued. Oh no, your excellency, the sister countered, but I cannot lie. It is unpleasant for me. And what do you do when you have such temptations against your work? For things that cost me greatly, I grew accustomed to facing them with joy and enthusiasm out of love for God, and then I offer them up for one soul on earth to whom God chooses to be gracious as a result. I have left completely up to him and I do not want to know. I also offer up my time of Eucharistic adoration every evening from eight to nine for this intention. Where did you get the idea to offer up all your merits for someone totally unknown to you? I learned it a while I was still out in the world, she replied. At school, our teacher, the parish priest, taught us how we can pray and offer our merits for our relatives. Besides that, he said that we should pray much for those who are in danger of being lost. Since only God knows who really needs prayer, it is best to put your merits at the disposition of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, trusting in his wisdom and omnipotence. That is what I have done she concluded, and I have always believed that God would find the right soul. How old are you? Kettler asked. Thirty-three, Your Excellency, she answered. The bishop paused a moment, and then he asked her, When were you born? The sister stated her date, her day of birth, and the bishop gasped. Her birthday was the day of his conversion. Back then, he saw her exactly as she was before him now. And have you any idea whether your prayers and sacrifices have been successful? He asked her further. No, Your Excellency. Don't you want to know? Our dear God knows when something good happens, and that is enough was the simple answer. The bishop was shaken. So continue this work in the name of the Lord, he said. The sister knelt down immediately at his feet and asked for his blessing. The bishop solemnly raised his hands and said with great emotion, with the power entrusted to me as a bishop, I bless your soul. I bless your hands and their work. I bless your prayers and sacrifices, your self-renunciation, and your obedience. I bless especially your final hour and ask God to assist you with all his consolation. Amen, the sister answered calmly and then stood up and left. The bishop, profoundly moved, stepped over to the window in order to compose himself. Some time later, he said goodbye to the Mother Superior and returned to the apartment of his bishop friend, and he confided to him, Now I found the one I have to thank for my vocation. It is the lowest and poorest lay sister of that convent. I cannot thank God enough for his mercy, because this sister has prayed for me for almost twenty years. On the day she first saw the light of the world, God worked my conversion accepting in advance her future prayers and works. Now here is our lesson. 
And these are according to the words of Bishop Kettler. What a lesson and reminder for me. Should I become tempted to vanity by a certain amount of success or by my own good works, then I can affirm in truth, you have the prayer and sacrifice of a poor maid in a convent stall to thank. And when a small and lowly task appears of little value to me, then I will also remember the fact. What this maid does in humble obedience to God, making a sacrifice by overcoming herself, it is so valuable before the Lord our God that her merits have given rise to a bishop for the church. Well, I need say a little more. I think we can draw all sorts of conclusions from this about our own sufferings, our own prayers, our own achievements and glories and joys and sorrows. Let us be mindful that we share in those with others. We should offer up all of those things of our own for the sake of others, even for someone you will never meet in your life. Amen. 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 Amen.